Well, good morning. Good morning. That was good. I figured you'd be sort of shy the first Sunday here. But I'm Michael Piazza, and I am the new pastor of the Arlington Congregational Church. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I know some of you are new, and I'm grateful we all get started at the same time. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, and I just want to welcome you. So this is the first Sunday of Advent, which means a couple of things. One is I hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday and uh, got your you know, fill of food and turkey and, uh, and haven't felt like you need to start your diet just yet um, because we're going to have a party afterwards, and I hope you'll stick around um, for that. But because this is the first Sunday of Advent, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of heads up about the way I sort of lead worship. Um, so... One of the things that I really value about the United Church of Christ is that we don't have a prayer book that says we have to do all of these things every Sunday, um, but we can pull from lots of different traditions. And so one of my sort of models for churches has been um, that we do worship seasonally. What that means is for the four, Sunday of Ad, four Sundays of Advent, we will do follow the pattern that's in this bulletin. Um, then we'll have Christmas, Christmas Eve, um, New Year's, and then Epiphany starts in January, and we'll have a sort of a slightly different order of worship during Epiphany until Lent. And then when we get to Lent, we'll have a slightly different order of worship for Lent, then Easter, and then following Easter, a slightly different order of worship after Easter. And then that goes all the way to Pentecost, which is usually the end of May, beginning of June, um, and then that begins ordinary time. And during ordinary time, we're going to have fun. We're going to do lots of fun things. The services are going to be more casual um, through the summer, obviously. And so that I just want you to sort of begin to anticipate. that. We'll, and what, what the advantage of that is, is that some of us come from very liturgical backgrounds where the service ought to be formal. And others of us come from evangelical backgrounds where the service ought to be really relaxed. Everybody will get a little bit of something that they like. And a little bit of something that they'll hate. But if you hate something, hang around. Four or five weeks from now, it'll change. It'll be all right. So I, that's what I hope we will do, and, uh, and that you'll begin to enjoy and appreciate other people's values and styles as well. And, uh, and we'll all survive it. Um, so my core value, and part of my reason, I think, for being here is, is growth. And by growth, I mean a couple of things. One is that I think my role as your new pastor is to help you and me grow spiritually. So I'm going to try lots of different things to get make that happen over the course of our time here. And I hope that worship is one of the ways that will happen. The second way that we, I hope we will grow is an, as the body of Christ, that we will be effective in our ministry in the world, and specifically in the world of Jacksonville, Florida so that our ministries have a greater impact. And in order for that to have the greatest impact, it brings me to I, my third definition of growth, which is we're going to need to grow in numbers. Once upon a time, I was here as a consultant of this church, and we talked about how to get attendance up over 200. We came very, very close then, but COVID and change of pastors and all those sorts of things has hit every church in America very hard, and this is no exception. And so one of my jobs here is to help you grow in numbers. There's still park, uh, uh, spaces in the parking lot, and there's still spaces in the pews. So if you will partner with me, we'll see if we can't fix those two space problems by filling it up, in the, filling up the pews and filling up the parking lot. Um, that's my other goal, um, because that will help us to be more effective in our ministry out in, in the world. So when we do something in worship, um, that you kind of cock your head and wonder why we're doing it, just remember to grow. That is almost always my only motivation, is to help the church grow spiritually, effectively, and numerically. And so that's what I, I hope to do. And so before the service, this service starts this morning, I wanted to um, just go through it with you so that uh, ev the rest of the services of Advent, you'll have it down pat. Now, the, next, the people who come next week for the very first time, they'll be totally lost. And you can explain to them like you're a veteran, even if this is your first Sunday here. 
So if you'll take your bulletins, we'll just look at what Advent is going to look like. And then the first Sunday of Epiphany, I'll do this again and again the first Sunday of Lent. We'll just go through it. So Advent in the liturgical calendar used to be called Little Lent, which meant that as a season of preparation, we prepared for Christmas with penitence, with repentance. Now, I'm not so much on that for Advent. We'll do a lot of that during Lent. But we do want to begin it as a little more solemn and serious season. So during Advent, we're going to be a little more formal. During Lent, we're going to be a little more formal. On high holy days, like Easter, um, we'll be a little more formal. And what that means is the service will be a little more liturgical. I'll use the pulpit instead of standing here. Um, and it'll just seem a little more formal for four weeks. Now, if you don't like it, just four weeks. You know, you can put on a tack for four weeks. Um, and, and then it'll change. So, so just hold on there. So this is what I mean by a little more formal. Um, I start welcoming people before the service even starts. And next week it'll take just a minute or two. Because this is our first Sunday. We're going to use the alms bowl to call people to worship, so we'll chime the hour. The choir is going to do an intro, a new piece of music probably to all of you called the Canticle of the Turning. It is an ancient piece of music, actually. It is Mary's Magnificat. It is Mary's song after Gabriel announces that she will bear a, a Savior. And if you listen to the Magnificat or you read it in Luke, it's a revolutionary statement. And this sort of captures that in a modern way. Um, so it's a, a new song, and what will happen is the choir is going to sing a, a verse of it and the chorus. And then we'll come back and all of us will sing a chorus of it. And then on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we'll sing the whole hymn together as a congregation. So the choir will sing it as our call, so as our intro, as our call to worship. Then we'll do a time of preparation, which is my version of confession. Um, the bidding prayer there is an 18th century prayer in modern language. So we're sort of joining the, the ancient tradition of the church in our praying together. Um, at the end of the bidding prayer, there'll be a, a time for us to do our own personal confession. And it'll be a significant time of silence. So you, I, I, I'm not assuming you have a lot to confess. I'm just assuming that I do. So we're going to have a, a, a significant time of silence there. And at the end of it, I'll say amen, and uh, Sally will lead us, and then we'll all sing the refrain of the song that the choir is going to sing in just a moment. Uh, with the assurance of pardon, we'll be done with me telling you you're forgiven, and you telling me I'm forgiven. And then, as a celebration of that, I'll invite you to rise and exchange signs of peace. So, as you are comfortable, if you're comfortable shaking hands, great. If you're comfortable hugging necks, great. If you're comfortable doing namaste, that's fine too. However, you're comfortable. But I want you to remember when you stand up that there are at least, I know for a fact, half a dozen people in this room that haven't been here before or only once before. And so your job is to find them and make sure they're welcome because those of you who are here regularly, you're the host, not the guest. So make sure the guests are always welcome. And that's one of the principles we'll help us to grow. And, and you can do that also, if I just can remind you, you can do that also by doing two things. One is, um, wear your name tag. It'll help me learn your name. And it'll help new people feel like, oh, I, that's who that is. And, and, and that's great. And the second thing is, at the time of the offering, we'll pass red registration pads down the aisle. And we ask that everyone register their attendance. Now, you may be thinking, I'm here every Sunday. They know I'm here. But what's going to happen is, not right away, but as soon as I can get the computers set up, what will happen is, if you don't register your attendance in three Sundays, someone's going to go looking for you. If you don't register in five Sundays, another group of folks are going to come looking for you. And if you're not here seven Sundays, you don't register seven Sundays, I'm going to hunt you down. We don't want you to just fall through the cracks. We want to be able to keep up with you. And since we have hopefully new people, the only way we can do that is to make sure everybody registers their attendance. The other thing is we don't want to ask guests to register their attendance unless we're willing. So you model that for our guests, and that way we can get contact information for our guests and can write to them and tell them how glad we were that they were here and invite them to come back again. But you pay, play a role 
by modeling. You, and all you have to do is just put your name down if we already have your information, and we'll invite our guests to also give us their email address or their contact information. So that, that'll be very helpful. Um, okay, so um, we'll open in him. I think the rest of this probably is fairly self-explanatory, but you'll begin to get it as we go through the season. What I try to do during Advent is to, to not sing Christmas carols right now. This is Advent. It's a season of preparation. We'll eventually get more and more Christmassy as we go along. But you'll notice there are pieces of service music embedded in the service that allow us to begin to get a flavor for Christmas. And then we will end the service. This service we have the Hanging of the Greens, which is a tradition that you have um, that our uh, that we'll, we will uh, celebrate. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of December, and we'll have communion together. Um, and so, uh, and then we're going to end the service with Jesus, what a wonderful child. Now, this is, this is one of my values, is that we're going to try to br bring music into the service that may not be, um, uh, that you may not be customary to. So music that is more multicultural, multiracial, new music, and ancient music. And, and to begin to celebrate a broad, broad range. So um, we're going to see how well we can do with this African-American gospel piece of music at the end. So you may not know it, but four Sundays from now you will. So just uncork it and give it your best shot. And uh, I think we'll have a good time together. I hope that will be one of our goals, is that you won't want to miss a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Because if you're not here, you will have feel like you've missed something. Um, hopefully a challenge, a, a good time, a, a time of community that since COVID we really desperately need again. And I hope every Sunday you'll go out of here thinking, I never thought about that. Or um, I need to work on that. Or I hope that is true and will come true for me. So that's our goal during the next four weeks is to talk about peace, hope, joy, and love. And by the time we get to Christmas, we'll at least have a, have a taste of all of that. I pray that will be true for you. And I hope that in the years to come, as we worship together, it'll be true for us all. So on this first Sunday of Advent, with all our hearts, Advent is a season of preparation. In that spirit, let us prepare our hearts to worship the God who comes to dwell in humble places. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, as we await the great festival of Christmas, let us prepare our hearts so that we may be shown its true meaning. Let us pray for the world that God so loved for peace and unity over all the earth, for the poor, the hungry, the cold, the helpless, and the oppressed, the sick and those who mourn, the aged and the little children, and all who rejoice with us on another shore and in a greater life, that multitude that none can number, whose hope 
was in the Word made flesh, and with whom, in our Lord Jesus Christ, we forevermore are one. O oh God. My heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Good news. We all have the power to turn our lives around and answer the call of the Spirit out of the night into the light. The dawn draws near. Emmanuel, God with us, is coming. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. As God's forgiven people, let us rise as you're able and exchange signs of the peace of Christ with those around you.
first lesson, we hear Isaiah's promise of a day of peace. Although that day has not come, we still hold on to this beautiful promise. Please listen for a word from our still-speaking God. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may learn God's ways and that we may walk in God's paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. May God add a blessing to the hearing of these words. Amen. In the Bible, the prophets Micah and Isaiah uh, say this. They say, God looks down and says, my people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And then nation will not rise up against nation and people will study war no more. It's this amazing vision of people beating their swords into plow, turning instruments of death into tools for peace and for life. And I love that vision. So much so that we actually met some blacksmiths and some welders that were like, we're ready to do it. <laughs> so we started doing it. We invited people to donate weapons if they had them, and they, and they you know, wanted to not see them used for, for death, but to see them converted you know, to something else. We turned an AK-47 into a rake and a shovel, and then we took uh, an, another AK-47, and it made three little hand trowels. I'm convinced that one of the things that we need a movement of is a movement of life, of Christians and others who are committed to to this idea that every person is precious. I live in Philadelphia, which we have almost one homicide a day. And there's been an, an, a powerful movement where people of faith and conscience have gathered outside of gun shops and uh, began vigiling, began raising questions about where the kids get the guns. And that started for me not as an issue, uh, a debate around gun control, but it started when a 19-year-old kid was killed on my front porch. And that was what stirred and moved this idea that, wow, what, what is God's dream for the world? I'm pretty sure it's not for one kid to die every day in Philadelphia of gun violence and not 10,000 people in the United States to die of gun, die from gun violence. So let's, let's reimagine our country. Let's reimagine the world because it doesn't have to stay the way it is. In the Bible...
long for you. Part of us knows that loving you and letting you love us and our world is the only path to truth for you. Yet still we have you, both in our lives and in our work. Change that, Father, we pray. Change in us. May the gift of this season be a seed of truth, and let it begin in each of us today. In the name of the Prince of Peace himself, amen. God be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And Jesus said, But nobody knows when that day or hour will come, not the heavenly angels and not the Son. Only God knows. As it was in the time of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the human one. In those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. They didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. The coming of the human one will be like that. At that time there will be, two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know what day the Lord is coming, but you understand that if the head of the house knew at what time the thief would come, he would keep alert and wouldn't allow the thief to break into his house. Therefore, you also should be prepared. Because the human one will come at a time you don't know. Hear this ancient witness from yesterday. Speak now, Holy One, through words that are ancient and words that are modern. Give them new life, a new relevance for our lives as we live them in these days. In your many names we pray. Amen. The Advent Conspiracy is an international movement whose stated purpose is to bring a deeper meaning to Christmas during the Christian season of Advent that immediately precedes it. It was created in 2006 as a reaction against the consumerism that has been surrounding this holiday, this holy day. Advent conspiracy was founded on the radical idea that we can celebrate Christmas humbly, beautifully, and generously. Advent 
is the story of a wondrous moment when God entered our world to make things right. It's a great story, and it can change the world and our own lives if we can learn to celebrate it faithfully. And this Sunday, we have lighted the candle of peace, which unfortunately is the starting pistol for a season of conspicuous consumption, frantic shopping, de de delirious decorating, anxious parties, aching loneliness, and precious little peace. Advent is a season of preparation. The church calls us to spend four weeks getting ready, not for Christmas, but for Christ. Is it possible that if we do our work well, the Prince of Peace might come to us again? Could the choir of angels again sing to us of peace? on earth, and goodwill to all. Well, we'll never know until we try. It's tragic that in a season when scripture and Christmas cards and carols speak of peace on earth, our own lives get so full of conflict and tension and anxiety. Although it is still November, most of us are probably already feeling a bit panicked about the oncoming Christmas holiday. In fact, most of the year, many of us are feeling overloaded, overwhelmed, and simply over it. Or as I like to say, we live our lives all stressed up with no place to blow. If there is ever going to be peace on earth, we must make peace first with an enemy that is more fierce and tenacious and insidious than any terrorist. Today, we begin our journey to Christmas by looking at how we make peace with the enemy within. No enemy is more destructive, no opponent more fierce, no challenge more daunting than making peace with ourselves. In Gulag Archipelago, Alexander Sozhenitsyn wrote, the line separating good and evil passes not through states or between classes, or between political parties, but through the human heart, through all human hearts. Even the best of hearts, in the best of hearts, there remains a corner of unvanquished evil. As you probably know, just a short distance north of here, is the Okefenokee Swamp. The swamp's most famous resident is a cartoon character named Pogo. You are probably familiar with Pogo's most famous saying, we have met the enemy and they are us. Now notice in the cartoon, Pogo is actually commenting on how only Humans litter their own environment. So too, you and I have cluttered our lives in a way that robs us of peace. And there is really no one else to blame. Now, that doesn't mean we can't find someone's, some way to make us someone's victim. We can pretend, heck, even... We can even blame Christmas for causing so much stress in our lives.
But the person who creates all our stress, almost all our stress, actually lives inside of us. He is the one who overextends because he's afraid of what he might discover if he spent too much time alone. She is the one who always has the TV or computer or radio on because she is afraid what she might hear if she got still and quiet. He is the one with something to prove. She is the one who can't make peace with her past and move on. So what is the path to peace with this fierce enemy who tears our lives apart and robs us of tranquility and joy? How do we find peace within? Well, Jesus said to his disciples, and therefore to us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You, you see, peace is a gift. A gift we'd have to get still enough and quiet enough to finally receive. The problem is that we miss the last part of this phrase of what Jesus said. Peace is given, but not in the way the world gives. In other words, it is not found in what we accomplish. It is certainly not found in what we accumulate. It is not obtained by finding the perfect mate. None of those things will give us the gift of inner peace. If you're going to defeat the agitator within, you must force them to face two realities. One, I think this is perhaps one of Jesus' hardest truths, is you can't have it all. And where would you put it if you had it? It is amazing how much stress we create for ourselves by our compulsion to acquire more. What are we trying to prove? And who are we trying to prove it to? We are the first generation who deliberately creates debt to relieve stress. Our internal enemy is using debt to separate us from the things we really want in life. It doesn't matter what you drive. What matters is what drives you. The other thing we need to tell our inter inner, inner tormentor is closely related. You can't be anything you want to be. Now, I know in America that is almost heresy, but it is simply true. Let's be real. None of us are that gifted, brilliant, or talented. What we must do is begin by making peace with who we really are and learn to celebrate the limits that make us uniquely who we are. All the self-help books in the world won't change the basic limitations of our individual lives. Oh, now, make no mistake, we can all be more than we are. We can all be better than we are. But none of us can be all that we fantasized we would be back when we were in high school. God didn't give us the gift of Christmas so that someday we would be great, or famous, or rich. In fact, the only way to experience the great gift of God is to believe that God's love is completely and totally ours today. 
right where we are, right as we are. It is ours. It is ours to be unconditionally and relentlessly loved by God. It is already your gift. You just have to make time and room and silence to receive it, experience it, celebrate it. If you are to find peace, you're going to have to find it inside yourself. Quit waiting for someone to make you happy because you are the only one who can do that. If someone else could make you happy, don't you think God would have already done it? And if God can't do it, then how do you think someone else is going to do it? Only you can do it. I tried to think of an illustration of someone who was undergoing a time of turmoil and stress and challenge, but somehow found peace within. What came to mind was a lunch that I had and a story that my friend, the late Peter Gomes, told me that day. Peter was, until his death, the chaplain at Harvard. And he told me about a time when Billy Graham, late in his life, came to preach at Harvard Chapel. Dr. Gomes said that Graham won great credibility with the Harvard students when he began his sermon saying, I am sick and dying, and I've never been happier. What a wonderful illustration of someone who found peace within. He assigned gospel lesson, which my partner David read, is a, a story about the predictions of the second coming of Christ. Now, evangelicals believe that a day will come when Jesus will return to earth again or will rapture us off the earth. Well, maybe. I don't know about that. But there is one thing I do know. One thing that will certainly come to pass for us all. Jesus will come again at the end of your life and at the end of mine. That can be a, sense, a, a, a source of anxiety. But remember this. This truth about Jesus. He came to the end of his own life. And it looked like in every external way his life was a failure. He owned absolutely nothing except the clothes on his back. He had alienated the leadership of his own religion. Even his own disciples right up until the end, didn't get who he was and why he had come. In every external way, it looked like his life would end at a fa as a failure. But then notice that he offers peace to us, his peace to us. That offer is found in John chapter 14. In John chapter 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. In other words, this offer of peace comes out of his own ending, his own impending torture and death. And yet in it, he found such peace that it was, there was sufficient to offer some of it to us. The end of his life, when all of his efforts seemed to have failed, Jesus offers us a great gift. This peace he offers is not some celestial peace in the by and by. It is not the peace of the, which the angels sing. It is an internal peace. 
that won't abandon you even when you come to the end of your work here. So my friends, don't leave this place today until you begin to receive again this Christmas gift. The gift Jesus came to give you. A peace the world cannot give you. But it also cannot take it away. Now, I'd like to invite us to continue our worship. If you'll take the red pads and register attendance if you have not yet done that. And if you will give generously to, you, to this time of tithes and offerings. May God bless your generosity that we may continue to serve the world. Today begins the holy season of Advent, a time when we prepare for the celebration of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and remember his promises to be with us in spirit and to return to us in time to come. Spiritually, we make place for Christ's birth in our hearts. We decorate our homes and communities in preparation to celebrate this wonderful gift from God. Today, we prepare our house of worship for his coming. God does not live in earthly temples made by human hands, but God knows that we need them in order to focus our worship. Nor does God require a fine place for the birth of the holy child. A manger and a stable is sufficient. But God accepts with pleasure the love and devotion we show in preparing a place fitting our Savior's birth. This morning, 
We share the Christian meaning behind these symbols to remind us that they are signs of Christ's presence and his promise to come again to us. Let us then make ready this house of God together, recalling the meaning of the symbols we use, that we may remember our children and our children be taught them. And let us joyfully anticipate the nativity of our Christ to the glory of God. The wreaths. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The wreath is formed in the shape of a circle. A circle has no beginning or end. This reminds us God's love never ends. Jesus is our Alpha and Omega, our beginning and our end. He has said he is with us always. The green color of the wreath, and the fact that it is evergreen, is the sign of the everlasting life we have through Jesus Christ. The symbol reminds us, too, of Christ rising from the dead. The fact that we celebrate his holy birth today is because he rose from the dead, the final proof he is God's son. The trees and the lights. In Gospel of John 8, 12, it says, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The tree has not always been a part of our Christmas decorations. One early story of how the Christmas tree came to be a part of Christmas says that on Christmas Eve in the year 1521 in Germany, Martin Luther went out into the night and looked up at the sky. He saw millions of stars twinkling brightly. Struck by this vision, he cut down a small fir tree and, shaking the snow from its branches, he took it into the house where his children were celebrating Christmas Eve. Come, he said, his family, let us light the candles and put them on the tree to remind us of the light of God's love. The point said us. In Psalm 103, 17, 18, we read, But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who reverence him. His salvation is to children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant and remember to obey him. The bright red poinsettia is the most popular of all Christmas flowers, and the use of the poinsettias at Christmas came from Mexico. The legend of this beautiful flower says on Christmas Eve, church people are invited to bring a gift of thanksgiving to the manger. One night, a poor boy quietly walked into his church. He had no gift to bring and was embarrassed. The legend says he was suddenly stopped by an angel who told him to pull a weed from the side of the road. The boy did as he was, at, as he was told and laid the weed on the manger and said a prayer of thanks. As he prayed, the weed was transformed into a magnificent star-shaped flower. This flower amazed everyone that night, and from then on, this flower has been used as decorations in our homes and churches. The red leaves are a symbol of Christ's blood, which gives us light. The star-shaped formation of red leaves reminds us of the star which came to shine in Bethlehem. The gifts of Christmas. In the Gospel of John 3.16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. From the beginning of Christmas celebrations, gift-giving has been a part of the season. The Magi brought treasures the shepherds gave of themselves in praise and adoration and faith. Both expressed the gift of God, giving Christ as the Savior of the world. Take with you the yellow sheet that is in your bulletins. It has all the announcements, and I'm going to trust that you can read or someone will read it to you, um, and I'm not going to do that, um, so I'll just trust you to notice the announcements there. 
I will invite you all to stick around. Uh, we have, I think, a ref, uh, refreshments out on the portico, um, so they're, you they're can't. They're in the back, Michael. Oh, they're in the back. They're in the first hall. Fellowship hall. Yeah. Okay, so if you'll go out and go that direction, there are refreshments, and uh, and if you're visiting with us, you know, I am by nature an introvert. No one ever believes that, but it is true. It is why I pastored a mega church. You didn't have to deal with people when you had 4,000 people at church. But I really am an introvert. So I understand if you are a guest and you are an introvert too, you're going to be sorely tempted to go out and turn left to the parking lot. But I just want to encourage you to come and join us in the fellowship hall um, so we can get to know you and welcome you and, uh, and you can contribute your energy to this time of celebration. Um, I'm glad to be with you, and I hope you'll stick around and be with us for a, a few more minutes. Sisters, brothers, siblings, all, our worship has ended, but now our service begins. As you go from this place, remember, you are the body of Christ, and so the whole world awaits you. So live passionately and love faithfully. And celebrate every moment of your life from now until the finale. For the God of relentless love goes with you. Amen. Amen.